Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and uh, welcome back to the podcast. And it's been a while since my last podcast, so I appreciate your tuning in and listening. And I wanted to deal with a subject here that's very important uh, to me. I suppose it could also be seen as an obsession of mine in some ways, and it's the subject of the uh, the impermanence and the perishability of knowledge, the fragility and perishability of knowledge. And it's a very sobering subject because once you really get into this topic and you really start to see it in historical context, you can't help in many ways but feel a shudder of horror at the thin margins by which man's knowledge has survived the millennia. In the midst of this onslaught, really, of of barbarism and savagery that constantly is encroaching upon the islands of the learned in many ways. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think we have to be conscious of the fact that what we think is so permanent, what we believe is so durable and everlasting, in many ways is very, very fragile and can be uh, taken away and vaporized at the blink of an eye. And I think we really need to reflect on that. And that's something that I hope that you will take away from this podcast. You know, I've been reading a, a very, very good book, and it's called Ancient Libraries. It's a, a scholarly work. It's a collection of, of papers by specialists and it's edited by Jason Koenig, Katerina Oikonomopoulou, and Greg Wolf, uh, W-O-O-L-F. It's a, uh, an academic type of book, but a very good book. And it deals with the subject of ancient libraries, all types of ancient libraries the, in, in Europe, the, Middle e- the Near East, Egypt. And there are some very sobering lessons in this book. And I want to talk about a few of them. I want to talk a little bit about the survival of Latin literature in Western Europe through the Dark Ages and the medieval period, and also about the destruction of the great royal library, the fabled royal library at Alexandria in Egypt, a topic that's been written about and discussed a great deal, but which still today many people are truly not fully informed about, and I think deserves uh, some some discussion on our part. So let's look here first at the first topic here, the topic of the survival of Latin literature in Western Europe. And what I think I can do, the best thing I can do here, is to read a passage from the book. This is the one of the first chapters of the book. It's The, the chapter is uh, called Approaching the Ancient Library. And let me just read this passage here for you, and then we can discuss this. He says, Mr. Wolf here says, The story of the transmission of Latin literature is a sobering one. It seems likely that most of what had been written survived in A.D. 500, and rich editions were still being produced for private collections in the 5th century. Yet between 550 and 750 A.D., almost no non-Christian manuscripts were recopied, so that when the scholars of the Carolingian Renaissance began collecting and copying classical books, most of which had probably survived in private collections in Italy, a great part of Latin literature was gone forever. If those general processes are clear, it is not always easy to pick out the factors that influenced the survival or loss of particular texts. By what set of parallel chances did Pliny's natural history survive when Aeneas's Annales did not? The latter had been phenomenally popular in the late Republic and survived for centuries longer, at least in a few copies available to grammarians, and perhaps philosophers too, since there may have been a copy of Book VI in the Villa of the Papyri. The natural history of Pliny, by contrast, is exactly the sort of text we might expect to be most at risk from attrition. Yet all but a few hundred lines of Aeneas have been lost, 
and Pliny's work somehow survived until the tastes and needs of the Middle Ages made it phenomenally popular. Luck and deliberate choice both played a part in the loss of one or the survival of another. Now, what does that mean? That's the passage. What does that mean? And just so you know, uh, the author is citing a particular work uh, uh, as um, uh, to to uh, to back up the, those uh, those assertions. Uh, the citation is Reynolds and Wilson, a book called "Scribes and Scholars: A Guide to the Transmission of Greek and Latin Literature," which was published in 1974. That's the citation. So anyway, what but what does that what does that passage really mean? Or what do we conclude from that passage? Well, the first thing is what the author is saying, is that by A.D. 500, by 500 A.D., almost, in his opinion, almost all of the corpus of classical literature in the Latin West was still intact. Most of what had been written was still intact by 500 A.D. Now, traditionally, the fall of the Roman Empire in the West is generally dated ar- arbitrarily, rather, uh, around 476 A.D. But according to this writer, most of Latin literature was still intact by 500 A.D. Yet, in a space of only 200 years, more or less, from 550 to 750 A.D., 200 years, almost no uh, pagan manuscripts were copied. The only work really done during that period was was uh, ecclesiastical literature, was church uh, uh, texts. So it only took 200 years for the majority of classical Latin literature to be consigned to oblivion. Just a 200-year period of neglect was all it took for most of it to be gone forever. Now, what we have of Latin literature is only a fraction of what actually was produced. And depending on who you talk to, there are some that say maybe only a fourth, one-fourth, one-quarter of what was produced. Um, that's that's a, a highly speculative number. But in any case, we know that what survives today is only a fraction of what was produced. And many of these texts survived only in uh, several copies. So we just got by by the skin of our teeth, which is why these texts are so important, so precious, and so uh, so vital to our civilization. Uh, but if it only took 200 years of neglect for the majority of Latin literature to be obliterated, what does that tell us? It tells us that if we don't preserve, curate, and protect our knowledge, the knowledge of, or the knowledge of any civilization, then it's going to be lost. We can't take things for granted. We cannot be idle. We cannot sit on our hands. We can't be complacent. We can't think that, oh, if it's here, it's great. It's gone. Oh, uh, you know, this is not like it was, you know, a thousand years ago. Things are different now. We have the internet. We have, uh, we have uh, electronic bullshit. Bullshit. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. In many ways, I think you could argue that the the very ease of availability of knowledge makes it makes us even more complacent than people may have been back in in uh, in those days. We don't know. We just don't know. But I see around me the cavalier and the uh, lackadaisical attitude that knowledge is uh, is treated with, and it's a great cause for concern because when you have this attitude. You're not going to do what you need to do to protect your cultural heritage. And this is a real, real problem. And the second part of the quote he talks about, you may not have picked up, but the, the, the author is talking about the survival of, of Ennius. Ennius was a, uh, a classical uh, Latin poet, very popular in Rome. Uh, almost nothing of his work survives today, but he was extremely popular. And yet he, his work has been completely obliterated by time. And yet Pliny's Historia Naturalis, which is a multi-volume, almost an encyclopedia really, of, uh, of um, uh, botanical, geographical, uh, medical, uh, artistic knowledge, 
that that has survived uh, com- in, in, com- in its complete form. So how is it that something that probably uh, one would have expected to be consigned to oblivion uh, survived, and yet something that was so popular did not? We just don't know. We just don't know. And I think it just really tells us the, the randomness of fortune, the intervention of fate, and the, uh, the ultimately the perishability of knowledge. And I think that we have to be constantly on our guard because every generation has to be manning the machetes. They have to be manning the scythes. They have to be pruning back the jungles and the tangled overgrowth of barbarism and savagery to keep that at bay and to ensure that knowledge and uh, scholarship survives. Because without that, we're no better than the beasts. We truly are no better than the animals. And I, I just find, to me anyway, I find that very, very sobering. I mean, Latin literature uh, lasted for, if we consider when it began, let's say, uh, you know, 250 BC to I mean, Latin literature had a run of many, many hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And yet it only took 200 years, which in historical time is not very long at all. It only took 200 years for most of it to be obliterated. And then when the Carolingian scholars, uh, Alcuin and uh, Charlemagne's uh, corpus of copyists around, you know, 800 AD started to re-examine uh, what was left to try to uh, disseminate uh, Latin literature. They had not much to work with at that time. By that time, a lot of it had been lost already because papyrus is, uh, it, it, it decays. It's, it's fragile. It's not like vellum. It's not like uh, modern paper. It's, um, unless texts are copied and widely produced, they are not going to survive. And this is something that uh, should be very, very sobering to us. And I, I don't know why, I don't know why more people aren't really reflecting on it. Because to me, it's, I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very sobering. And here's a, here's another quote here along the same subject. Uh, the author says, "At Constantinople, the tradition of creating and developing imperial libraries remained unbroken, if more energetically in some periods than before." Nearly 300 works of classical scholarship were summarized by the 9th century patriarch Photius in his Bibliotheca. During the 8th century, the Abbasid Caliphate sponsored a great campaign of translation which, among other things, created Arabic versions of the mass of philosophical, scientific, and technical prose available in Greek or in Syriac or Pahlavi translation, and stored them in a court library, the Beit al Hekma. Some of the originals must have survived in the municipal libraries of the former Eastern Roman provinces, and some were consulted in Constantinople. The situation in the West was different. There is little evidence of anything resembling a library north of the Alps between the 6th and mid-8th centuries AD. The classical holdings of the great monastic libraries that appeared during the Carolingian Renaissance, libraries like those at St. Gall and Lorsch, may have depended ultimately on a small number of exemplars surviving in private aristocratic collections and school collections rather than on the relics of great Western libraries. The history of the book is a complex one, marked by periods of gradual loss, alternating with energetic episodes of copying, dissemination, and accumulation. The creation and destruction of ancient libraries has a place in that story, but it does not supply the central narrative. Well, that's the quote anyway. And we can debate whether how much of that we want to take at face value or how much we want to believe, but I think the outlines are generally factual. And again, on the subject of the perishability of knowledge, you know, I, was, I, I tweeted uh, earlier th- or this past week, I happened to see an article about um, the University of Notre Dame is decided to cover up some murals, some artistic murals that were done in the 1880s that depicted the uh, Columbus's uh, discovery of the North American continent. And I guess these were just, uh, you know, murals. And I, I saw a few of them. They looked, you know, ba- relatively harmless, just, uh, just uh, you know, standard uh, late 19th century murals. And I guess they were covering them up because... 
They did not want to offend anyone. And, you know, you can say that, you know, what difference does it make? What's the big deal? Who cares? But I think it does, I think it is a very important, I think it's a very significant thing because I think when we talk about the destruction of knowledge, one of the primary drivers of that is neglect. Neglect. It's not so much a catastrophic, malicious destruction of things that that attrites away our corpus of of um, of scholarly knowledge. It's apathy. It's apathy that does it. It's neglect. When a nation, when a country, when a culture loses confidence in itself, when it no longer is animated by that 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 spirit of purpose, that sense of mission then it begins to neglect its heritage. It begins to neglect and to disrespect the things that, uh, the things that uh, came before it. And that's a very, very dangerous road to go down because once you do that, you, lead your, you leave yourself open to, to the, the gradual and almost imperceptible loss of things over time. So, you know, I don't even want to get into this whole, the whole debate over, you know, the, the merits or demerits of the age of discovery. Okay, look, it's a historical fact. It was a central, the books, I've, I've read some very, very good books that say, that, that, that uh, point out how it was a central feature, not just in, in uh, the history of the world, but in, in, in the, the biology of the world. You had two, two zones that had been hitherto separated, coming into contact, and there was a, a tremendous exchange and fusion of of everything, really. Knowledge, fruits, vegetables, uh, uh, you know, uh, cultural uh, uh, intermingling. It was a very, very central process. In many ways, that's not fully understood today. And to just say that, that we're not going to look at that, we're not going to study that, we're not going to talk about that, to me is a is a great tragedy and it really says that um, we've lost we've lost our confidence we've lost our ability to to um, to look at the past with an objective eye and I find that very very dangerous a very very dangerous precedent now the second issue I wanted to deal with in this podcast is the destruction of the great library at Alexandria in antiquity. And, and this is something that is, is known by many people. It's, it's a very famous uh, readers or listeners may be aware that the, um, the, during the Hellenistic period, the, 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 the Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt established a great library, a royal library and museum at Alexandria. And it was one of the great libraries of antiquity, along with Pergamum and a few other places. And Rome had a number of imperial libraries, uh, which I won't go into, but had, Rome had a, actually a, a number of libraries, uh, which are discussed in uh, the works of Aulus Gellius. Um, but the Library of Alexand- Alexandria is the most famous, and we don't know exactly what its holdings were. Nor do we really even know exactly where it was. We have a general idea, but not a complete picture. But according to various accounts, it probably held several hundred thousand volumes. And it vanished. It, it, it's gone. It's gone uh, today. And it's clear now, this, the latest scholarship that's been done, uh, it, it's for, for some time it was blamed, the destruction of the library was blamed, on the Islamic conquest, and, and that, that theory has been decisively discredited back in the 19th century, the work of, um, and you can find that quoted in uh, J.B. Burry's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. The annotated edition has, uh, has very good work that debunks that, that theory. But the loss of the library happened gradually over the centuries. It happened gradually over time. From The, the first real disaster to hit the library was during the time of Julius Caesar, when he was involved in the Civil War. Uh, they say that, um, I think it was 48 BC, when he landed at, at uh, Alexandria, uh, he burned the ships of one of his rivals, and the fire spread on the docks, and the fire either partially or completely consumed the library there. But um, 
it seems that the library was damaged at that time, but but almost certainly not not fully destroyed. It, it persisted for many centuries. But I'm going to read a passage here from an article in this book, which is uh, by uh, Michael Handis, and the chapter is entitled "Galen and the Alexandrian Library." So let's let's look at that and then discuss what he says. He says, "When was the Alexandrian Library destroyed?" We know that Julius Caesar set fire to his enemy Pompey's ships in the harbor of Alexandria in 48 BC, which spread to the docks. Did Caesar destroy the library? There are scholars who believe he did, just as there are scholars who dispute the claim. Was the library destroyed in 215 AD, when Caracalla's troops looted property and slaughtered Alexandrians for an insult done to him? In 273 AD, when Aurelian retook Alexandria from the usurper Zenobia of Palmyra, much of the palace district where the library and museum were supposedly located was destroyed. In 297 AD, Diocletian brutally crushed a revolt in Egypt and deported half the population of Alexandria. There were earthquakes in 319 or 320 and 365 AD, which damaged Alexandria also. Was the library destroyed with the Serapeum Library in 391 when Christians sought to enforce Theodosius II's decree to close all pagan temples? So this is what what emerges in the quote, that we we don't really know exactly what caused the destruction of the Alexandrian Library, but it's, to me at least, it is uh, or was a combination of a number of factors spread out over time. And I think it comes back to neglect and apathy. It no longer became important for the people whose job it was to maintain these libraries to maintain them. They no longer felt it was an important part of their culture. And just in, 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 in the same way that uh, language death, we, when we see languages... Uh, declining and 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 going extinct around the world, if the speakers themselves do not maintain their language, then the language is going to die. If the custodians of a great library do not maintain their heritage, then their heritage is going to die. This is the takeaway lesson. This is what we need to be aware of. And the cautionaries need to be sounded now. The alarms need to be sounded now, because. The things that we believe are so permanent and so resistant to time's inroads may not be, may not be at all. Now, I think it's also worth noting that this same author raises a legitimate question. He says, well, he basically says, does it make any difference? Is there any evidence that the Alexandrian library contributed anything to the survival of of, uh, classical Greek literature? I mean, the, the the Alexandrian library had both Greek and Latin works, but the vast majority of the works are believed to have been Greek. And he asks the legitimate question. He says, um, there are some scholars who who might say that the destruction of the library made no difference really at all in anything. It really didn't make much difference. And let me read a passage from the book here again. He says, Did the Ptolemaic avid book collecting affect Greek literature, making works more accessible, canonizing the written words of authors, and thereby assuring the survival of such works? Or in the end, did it only serve to promote the aims of the two dynasties with no bearing on the survival of Greek literature? In short, did the Alexandrian library truly make a contribution to Greek literature, or was it an intellectual exercise lost to history? There is evidence that the scholars of Alexandria exerted some influence over the organization of Homer's Iliad and classical Greek poetry in general, but there is no evidence for other subjects. If the texts housed in the Alexandrian library were copied and distributed to individuals and to other libraries, then the scholars would have had an influence that would be undetectable. There is just no way to know. Bagnell asserts, Indeed, no more books would have survived antiquity if the library had not been destroyed, deliberately or accidentally, than did so anyway. The destruction is simply not important. All the libraries of antiquity were destroyed. 
Byzantine and Islamic medieval libraries were also were, were also dispersed and torched, many works never to be seen again. Wars destroy cultural artifacts, including libraries. This is a sobering thought, which must ultimately call into question the wisdom of large concentrations of books in ancient or modern times. Human efforts to bring all literature together may ultimately be doomed to frustration, but there is no doubt that large libraries contribute enormously to the advancement of knowledge while they exist and are maintained. And I think the key words there are while they exist and are maintained. Now, the author brings up some valid points, and this is a, a, a valid contrarian idea. You know, hey, does it make any difference? Did it really make any difference whether these great libraries were destroyed? This happens, and should we really should we really be too concerned about it? Well, well, to me, there's no doubt in my mind that it absolutely does make a difference. It absolutely does make a difference, and I think any assertion to the contrary is both irresponsible and negligent. Both irresponsible, factually wrong, and negligent. Because who can doubt that... The preservation and cultivation of knowledge bespeaks our respect for that legacy. And even if all of the great libraries of antiquity or the medieval period were doomed to dissipation, that doesn't mean that the efforts in preserving these monuments were in vain. It doesn't mean that the efforts were in vain. Because it is far, far better to try to resist the tide, the avalanche of barbarism, than to just to sit on your sit on your hands and do nothing to promote the preservation of knowledge. And I'm not so sure, I don't believe what that writer says that the scholars that worked at the Alexandrian Library or the Library at Pergamum or the Byzantine libraries or the Islamic libraries or the library or the, the monastic collections of Western Europe uh, were just uh, not doing anything of, of significance. Nonsense. They absolutely were. You know, we, the, um, I've read, I don't know, I don't know the Greek language, but I do know that many of our, the, the collation and the division and, and, and standardization of many classical texts were done during the Hellenistic period in, in such libraries. Uh, the scholars who worked on standardizing the Greek language with and those, those diacritical marks that so, uh, uh, that are, such a prominent feature of, of ancient Greek, those were invented by or, or standardized and promoted or, and, and used by scholars uh, during the Hellenistic period. So to say that it just doesn't matter, I think is wrong. It's wrong and I think it's also uh, irresponsible because it, it promotes a callous attitude towards books that we uh, need to resist at all costs. So... These are these are things to think about. I hope that this podcast has given you something to think about when it comes to the preservation of knowledge, the preservation of books, and just how quickly knowledge can just evaporate before our eyes. You know, I, I mentioned, I, I think I saw, I mentioned on Twitter that I, I saw a, a documentary recently on Netflix about a Polish sculptor and artist. His name was um, Stanislaw uh, Zukalski. And he was a popular artist in the 1920s and 30s, and he was uh, uh, almost one of Poland's nat- uh, national uh, artists. But he lost everything when uh, the Second World War broke out, when his studio was bombed in Warsaw. Everything was gone. He escaped barely with two suitcases, and everything was just lost. That's how fast uh, things can, can happen. All of his artworks were just, were just gone. But I think I think the danger today is not just war and 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 time, but just neglect. I think neglect is our biggest enemy. Neglect, and we have to we have to respect the past. We have to honor the past. We have to promote the past. We have to venerate the past, and we have to learn about the past. That is our mandate, and by doing that, we can make that which came before us live forever and that'll be all for tonight i'm quintus courteous good night